Hi, I'm Sandy O'Sullivan. I'm a professor in Indigenous Studies at Macquarie, and I'm here to talk about a few things, but primarily um, I'll be discussing the idea of futures, a little bit about futurisms, and the idea of who has a voice in this space. And so I'm going to be looking at museums, the way that we understand and describe history, who gets to make claim. And I'll just start by saying um, I'm here on Daragnora. Uh, I'm very lucky to be here in this space. This is uh, a remarkable space of learning. Uh, and I pay my respects as always to uh, ancestors here and my own Rajri ancestors um, who've made it possible for me to be here. So in the work that I do um, as, as a professor, I focus very heavily on the idea of how we know ourselves as Indigenous people, how we uh, understand one another, how we speak about one another, and I primarily work on the notion of how our futures uh, are being developed now and how it, how they will be. So I do that by looking at identity. I do it by looking at uh, history and the way that history is framed specifically in museums. So I'm going to tell a few stories with this, but I'm going to start by saying the Turnbull reading, um, I can't stand it. <laughs> I actually think it's a terrible reading um, for a range of reasons. It's a reading that in some ways is of its time. Um, I, I've been an academic for 30 years, but uh, for a lot of those first 15, uh, there were very few uh, Aboriginal people writing about our futures. There weren't none. There We existed. But there were a lot more other people who were out there to talk about whether um, the future would exist by looking, our futures would exist by looking at our past. And they did it in a very interesting way by looking at the notion of loss and of removal. So this idea of loss in particular, loss, so language loss, as you would have read in the piece, um, is highly contested as an idea. Languages were not lost. They were stolen. They were taken. That was the function of the colonial project. Um, its entire idea is to do that. Um, and so loss then becomes very tricky as a kind of tracking of notions of the future. What future can you have if everything is taken away? Is it a reinstatement? And in fact, it's not. Um, what happens with stolen languages is that they're reclaimed by people. Um, what happens with knowledge um, that is taken uh, or not well kept is that we move forward with what we have. So I'm going to show some slides now that take us through a few of these concepts. That's me. I want to talk a bit about expansive futures, challenges to the colonial project of gender, history, and everything else. Now, I do a lot of work on gender, and I do a lot of work on gender partly because I'm a gender studies theorist as well, but also because gender as part of the colonial project is one of the containers that we find ourselves um, forced into. Again, futures are not yet written, but futures begin today. You know, they don't begin in some romanticised future that we might see in some futurism's work uh, that is often framed as a kind of speculative approach. In fact, spec fiction is often called futurisms. Uh, but there is work by people like um, Anishinaabe um, writer Grace Dillon, who challenges this, actually wrote and coined the term Indigenous futurisms. And uh, and challenges that this is about making a romanticised future where all things are fixed, but rather says it's the one where we write our own story. So I work in the Centre for Global Indigenous Futures, uh, along with Zach and along with the other people who are at um, in the department, uh, and with a uh, hundred other. Uh, 
First Nations academics from around the world. We focus on future worlds, intimacies, relationalities, and locating ourselves in digital futures. There are three areas. All of our work is future focused. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't consider the history. History is a crucial part of all of the work that we find ourselves doing. Every project that I do, I'm a researcher, I'm an ARC Future Fellow. Every uh, future, <laughs> um, every bit of work that we do is uh, that I do is 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 informed by Yindamara Wilangana, which is the wisdom of respectfully knowing how to live in a world worth living in. So it's about making that world and continuing to make that world. So to challenge the Turnbull work, you know, which is about how do you fix things? This isn't about fixing things. This is about continuing to have a world that is worth living in and then living in it um, and being of it. And of course, that requires in the context of Indigenous futures, Indigenous people. And it, it requires Indigenous people to be the authors uh, of that. So I do this work that is on challenging these tropes. And I start with gender and sexuality. You know, this project that I'm doing is mapping the influence of Indigenous LGBTIQ plus uh, creative artists. But actually, it's much more than that. Of course, it is. It's it's looking at uh, the influence and the uh, power of the work that, um, that creative artists who are queer and who are Indigenous are making, but the reason that I'm doing that is to recognise that the complexity of who we are as people actually makes us able to create um, infinite possibilities for our community. And so I do work on challenging the colonial project. Colonial project contains, right? We know that's what it does. It puts people into containers. And so anything that busts out of those containers or questions those containers is an incredibly important part of understanding the colonial project and understanding how we can all challenge it, how we can do anti-colonial work. So I happen to do that work on gender. I have an archive that's actually about challenging symbolic annihilation. Um, this archive is um, set up as a proof of concept audit and database. Uh, the idea with it is to, uh, and I'm working with uh, um, some uh, master students and uh, my co-researcher on this project, and the idea is to challenge symbolic annihilation, which is... Um, not quite the same as actual annihilation, but it's pretty close. The idea is uh, with symbolic annihilation is the idea that if you're not present, so looking at we're looking at uh, screen-based work, so TV shows, if you're not present in that, um, if you're never present in those representations, how do you know how to be in the world if you're never able to see yourself, never able to be, see someone like you. Does it force you into being somebody that you're not? Or does it just mean that you never see yourself represented? And so we're trying to set up ideas about how we can locate the complexity, how we can uh, promote the complexity of identity that's found. Uh, every year there's more queer representation um, and there's also more Indigenous representation, and unsurprisingly, there's more queer Indigenous uh, uh, representation. And so it's trying to understand what that complexity provides for an audience. And story, this idea of exploring Indigenous survivance, which I'm going to come to next, um, to map how, we, how these artists conceive of their work to imagine their future and to do this protest, challenge, inquiry, affirmation, mapping, mapping the power. Come back to that. So Indigenous survivance is the idea that if we exist now, then we've always existed and we will exist in the future. So it's, uh, it's coined as a term, Indigenous survivance, by... Uh, a um, First Nations scholar, Visna, who talks about this as not just a continuance 
uh, but also as a promise to the future. Uh, and the notion that, again, if we exist in the form that we exist in now, we existed in one of those forms in the past. So it challenges the colonial project that requires proof, that requires physical proof that it may have also, the colonial project, may have also removed from us. So that again, looking back at the Turnbull work, one of the problems with it is that it's very much set around proof, how to get things back, how to know, how to understand uh, who is Indigenous is even in there, who is, you know, who are these people, what are these containers? So it's very much a colonial undertaking as a work. So I spent quite a few years um, looking at museums and in light of the work that I did uh, in that space, I, uh, I worked on understanding the capacity for museums to represent and engage First Nations people. I visited about 470 museums to look at how they did that. And I became really interested in the way that curators would very unproblematically uh, speak of the past, especially the deep past. So I have up here a slide that's Ice Age art, arrival of the modern mind. The Ice Age ages in Europe, and this was focused on European um representations or figures mostly that are available. So I'll just scoot it forward to an example of the Lion Man and the Villendorf frigate figurine. And here's a few more for you as well. So these figures are largely from anywhere from 40,000 years ago to uh, around um, 20,000 years ago. So they're very ancient. Um, there's no writing or other material that accompanies these. There's no way of knowing the stories of um, how these figures were understood at all. Um, the only way that curators uh, who have the responsibility of, of acting as a, a kind of interlocutor for um, the for the the visitor who goes into the museum, but generally for um, the better understanding of those objects in their care is uh, for them to do some guesswork. And uh, the guesswork has always been uh, based on a range of things. It's come from the archaeological record. So it's come from excavation processes where um, objects are uh, co-aligned um, co uh, with other objects. And so there is therefore either a timeline set um, or there, or in, there is uh, some understanding of, of of who and and what was invested um, in that work um, that they found, and so so with all of these kinds of objects, with the figurative objects, what they needed to understand was a little about um, the arrival of the modern mind. This idea that the mind isn't just producing something that's practical. It's coming up with something that's artistic. It's an artistic rendering. So what's its function? So, so when Jill Cook put this together, part of what, as a curator, you know, is a very um, accomplished uh, senior curator um, who went through and found some extremely important um, ways to connect all of this up, ways to start to think about the relationship between some of these objects that were found largely across Europe, right? So I'm mentioning Europe here rather than looking at Indigenous representation because, again, um, there is a very strong disconnect um, with within contemporary European contexts and their historic past. And this was an attempt to bridge that. So it was a really interesting uh, process, but they make a lot of assumptions. And in fact, there are a lot of assumptions made throughout this particular um, work, uh, this, this exhibition and the subsequent book that came of it. And one of those assumptions is that um, the figures are either masculine or feminine. Now, 
That's interesting. Um, often framed as male or female, sometimes as woman and man, but almost always binary gendered. Now, the work I do is often about challenging how they know. How do they know about the, the gender of these figures that come from, in the case of the Willendorf figurine that you can see there, um, um, 30,000 years ago. In the case of Lion Man, um, 40,000 years ago. Why is one a man and one a woman? Actually, they're figures, they're <laughs> neither. But also what demonstrates the idea of he and she that's used all the way throughout the exhibition. Um, these binary notions of gender are often challenged nowadays. Now, they always have been, actually, um, across literature. But what we don't know is if they were challenged 30,000 years ago. Now, I don't know that, and I can't prosecute that case, but neither can Jill. And yet we're faced with these incredibly binary gendered understandings of these bodies. So the Willendorf figurine for a very long time was uh, sometimes known as Venus of Willendorf, um, was often framed as a, um, as a, a, a figure that's pregnant. Recently, there's been uh, quite a different way of thinking about the Willendorf figurine and they frequently f think of, um, of, the, of, uh, the figurine as, uh, as a perspective work, so somebody looking down on their body. Um, they actually have no evidence that this is a pregnant um, figure except on the basis of a 19th century understanding um, of the figure itself and through their own lens, through their own understanding of the world, 19th century person talking about something from... Um, millennia before. <laughs> so uh, similarly with Lion Man, is this a European lion? Uh, is that why a man doesn't have a mane? Um, is that a pubis sticking down? Is it a penis? You know, so th there are all of these discussions around the idea of the upright figure shows masculinity, the soft figure shows femininity. I'm a non-binary person, um, and I can tell you I'm not a woman, and Venus of Willendorf looks a lot like me. So I challenge through Visner's survivance to say that, sorry, if I exist now, we've always existed. And the proof is really there on historians to challenge that. Now, what does this has to have to do with futures and futurisms? Everything. Um, the way that we talk about our future and conceive of it is to be expansive. Um, as Indigenous people, we want expansive ways of thinking about our world. Uh, and yet, when we look to the past, we see these retractions. We see these ways that were imagined in the way that Turnbull writes about us as uh, loss and uh, contained and uh, able to be understood. And yet our futures surely should be wide open. And so when we look to curatorship, we frequently see our past made less complex. When we look to contemporary exhibition, we often see our, our, our current times as complex because otherwise they're refuted. You'd just simply walk in there and go, that's not true. So when I was doing the project, I visited uh, a number of museums to look at how they were representing their own First Nations people. And I was very interested in this idea that perhaps that started to emerge from it, that perhaps there was a greater complexity being found in First Nations museums or museums that had a number of First Nations people in them. Maybe it's that same challenge as, as to um, uh, the Turnbull work that when you have someone who's non-Indigenous who writes the story of who you can be, it becomes far more narrow than when you get people who are demonstrating their own complexity. And this started to seem plausible as a, as a research uh, outcome. I uh, didn't know. Obviously, no research should uh, lead with, um, with a, 
uh, guesswork, but I had hoped that the complexity would help, but I didn't know how. So as I started to go through, this is the National Museum of the American Indian uh, in Washington, D.C. It's one of 20 Smithsonian museums, or 21 actually now, um, uh, Smithsonian museums that uh that have a different each each with a different focus actually two of them are na the national museum of the american indian there's one in new york and one in dc uh, this is the larger of the two what you're seeing on the um on the right hand side is a picture of um of the capitol building the building where all decisions are made um uh, uh in the united states uh and facing that is some corn being grown out the front of the um, NMAI, National Museum of the American Indian. And it is the first building that you come to from the Capitol building. And in fact, that's where it is, as you can probably see. So it's over, it has the Air and Space Museum just next to it in the National Mall. It's a museum that has uh, a pretty straightforward brief of representing thousands and thousands of communities across the Western Hemisphere. So it's got a very broad brief. And they have stories from community, contemporary voice. Um, one really important voice is the voice of the interpreter. So there's multiple interpreters, um, but each interpreter acts uh, to challenge tropes of identity and to provide more accurate understandings. So again, rather than reducing what we know, the potential possibility built on what people already know. So we'll use the example of Dennis Odig here, who is uh, playing a drum and uh, will each time go. Now, that's a, a a drum beat that uh, many people know from um, from Hollywood. <laughs> so, with the emphasis on the first drum beat, and Zodig says it's a fiction. It's a Hollywood fiction. It's not true. There's no truth in in this as in. Um, as an indigenous drumbeat, um, people who go in and see this, they walk away with knowledge that reminds them what, that when people get things wrong about the past, they can be corrected in the minds of people who are reviewing that again. When people go off and they watch like a, uh, a Western, <laughs> um, they can see that this is wrong, this is challenged. Um, and they know a little bit more. In addition to that, what Zodig does is uh, replaces it with some truthful and important ways of thinking about drum beats, and people leave with that too. So they're leaving with knowledge that's expansive, and they're leaving behind the knowledge that's reductive. Always Becoming is a really interesting exhibition out the front, but this also reminds me that there is another um, important moment, and and that's that you know this is a museum that was very focused on challenging um, the tropes of what a museum should be. Uh, for all that it's a museum of the Smithsonian, a very formal and structured uh, space, always becoming um, is uh, a work that has uh, representations by the by a contemporary artist of. Um, uh, uh, Nora Nar Naranjo Morse um, of uh, people set into this idea of um, of a building. So so they're made as buildings. So there's there's two older and one younger. There's only what two that are visible there. And as time goes on, the the clay around it um, falls away because obviously it's out outside um, and it rains and it snows and it does all of those things. It's hot. So, so each year another group of people come along and build it up again. And so that notion of decay and renewal 
that idea that there is uh, future work that needs to happen to renew this, that this is an ongoing relationship with First Nations people is uh, a crucial part of that journey too. Uh, so I was there asking um, museums or people who worked at museums what works when it comes to representation of First Nations peoples. And interestingly enough, uh, everybody, everybody at the, um, at the museum, at the National Museum of the American Indian, said the Mitsutam Native Food Cafe had um, six different uh, areas that all represent different parts of the Americas and really quite remarkable food there. But what was even more remarkable about it was um, that in this space where it's so close to the Capitol building, people coming down, walking in, going to the cafe, this is the first restaurant that they come to, these people who make decisions about, you know, the broader nation. Um, this space, this notion of ingesting, this idea, um, reminded a, me of a really important thing, and that's that, um, you know, museums, they may not be that important, but everyone needs to eat. And so this idea of engagement with food is something that sometimes we poo-poo when it comes to thinking about culture, but food changes um, for a range of reasons. And there are opportunities to explore and engage and ingest, in fact, um, to make this a part of a future that you have um, when you visit these spaces. There's also an interesting problem with this, and this is Infinity of Nations, um, National Museum of the American Indian in New York. Um, they had some remarkable, beautiful work, actually, um, representing multiple communities, um, hundreds, actually. Um, <laughs> problem is, uh, it was one object to represent an entire community with a story, one object with a story. But part of what it did was to say, you can find out more. You know, so it wasn't an object that was meant to be um, the object of a community. It was this idea that you can learn something complex about a community and then seek to learn more. Uh, it, it also challenged that idea that First Nations people were one kind of people. We have this in Australia in this context of um, Aboriginal language people will often say, uh, people will talk about it as though it's a monolith. Um, and we know it's not, there's, there's hundreds of languages and lots of different ways of, um, of people engaging with their language as well. And that's what was happening here. This was lots of different ways that people are engaging with objects that were included. Um, a remarkable work actually. And then we start to see, this is ramp it up. Um, we start to see this work that's about trying to engage people who are outside of the space of um, the museum, who are usually outside and less engaged with that notion of the museum. And look, museums don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. They just they just house ideas and thoughts and some objects. Um, but they've been these really dangerous places for First Nations peoples um, because they stole stuff, including our bodies. So in that danger, you have to ask the question, why bother to engage with them at all? And the answer is because we have a right to find a place in them. They're our spaces too. And work like Ramp It Up was about saying, um, look, there's um, this, this important skateboarding movement in the Southwest um, we're going to take it to the northwest, um, northeast rather, um, and we're going to have a place where this is um, able to be um, engaged and understood and people can participate in this and they can see that we're not the stereotypes that that people think we are. 
But that's one thing. That's like almost educative, you know, is that in the Marawin and Ghana, is that making a world in which you want to live? Not really. The making a world is continuing to skateboard in the Southwest, um, is continuing to do that work and to make a claim for it. Um, but also it's about remembering the past. And, you know, before I said sometimes it's Indigenous curators, uh, I, I found out of the research that were the most likely to want to tell complex stories. And that was true with Native Words, Native Warriors, which was um, a, uh, a, a an online project, continues, you can have a look at it, um, that is uh, a part of the, the Code Talkers um, exhibition, which was an exhibition that sought to re remind the world or actually inform the world that um, during the Second World War, there were a number of different communities. Uh, people will often talk about Navajo, but there were other communities that were also um, engaged in it who um, who used their language um, or their language was used and they were the, uh, the people who were able to uh, translate. Uh, in order to use it as a as a form of code that was unbreakable by the enemy, so um, so this was about contribution to the broader nation state, and it was about the unique gifts of language. Um, it tells a really different story as well for um, for this notion of language coming from the soil is one of the examples. This idea that language matters in that way, to hear that in the context of a um, of a, a kind of military exhibition is a really interesting um, juxtaposition as well. And it shows complexity rather than a narrowing, reductive way of thinking of the past. Indivisible was another very interesting um, project that looked at um, the idea of uh, in fact, there's an exhibition that's a co-exhibition that's called Red and Black and then Indivisible, um, the idea of communities that are both um, uh, First Nations communities and Black communities and in, in the coming together. So um, so in the intermarrying, in the um, relationships that were formed for a range of reasons um, and uh, including... Um, listed here as the struggle against slavery and dispossession, but including um, through slavery. And there is a real complexity to how this story is told. That arguably wouldn't have been told the same way by a, a, a non-Indigenous curator or in a non-Indigenous museum. Um, so museums and communities are really interesting for this reason as well. Um, and one of the um, the things that we like to look at when we're um, when we're thinking about how these uh, these museums work in communities is to is to consider um, what their role is as a um, as not just and I'll just bring us forward as not just a a site of exhibition, but as a site of gathering, as a site that offers other opportunities and other ways for the community itself to engage. And so here we have the Potawatomi Healing Trail, which is part of the Potawatomi Museum in Wisconsin. Um, this is the Pequot Museum that also has a way to, um, to take people up 40 stories to look out onto the Pequot um, uh, land. Um, a 360, if you like, across that. Um, this is, again, uh, Pequot uh, gathering place. Um, and this is that opportunity to be able to look out and to see um, the land itself from the museum. Now, a lot of, uh, uh, interestingly, a lot of, um, a lot of First Nations museums deal with time and they're often chronological spaces. So it starts with deep time. It takes you through a journey of um, building communities. And then at the end, 
through a kind of contemporary rendering of um, young people within that community. Here's some pictures of First Nations kids, um, Pequot kids, actually. Um, and here at the end is a uh, an image that you see, but also this is actually the image of it, um, of uh, the casino and hotel, which is a major source of income for the Pequot community. And so there are some very interesting renderings when you come through and you look all the way through at the representations of First Nations people. You're seeing the complexity of who people really are, not the tropes of identity. Um, you're seeing when it's made by people uh, who they value and how they want to have that, rep that those people represented, um, how they want to talk about their contemporary selves. Uh, now, Almost everybody that I ever heard going through this space would talk about the fact that most of the people appeared to be black um, and in their rendering, not native, um, using native, using the term that's used in the US um, by First Nations communities. Uh, and this was a really interesting take on this because, uh, you know, again, this idea of a narrowing to the trope of identity that you expect. Uh, there was a lot of criticism of the fact that a casino uh, was there, but the majority of the money that the Pequot community make is off their hotel. There was no criticism of that. So this whole idea of the reductive, observed Indigenous person, not the kind of community that's, uh, uh, that's thriving, is a really intriguing one. Now this is um, this is Saginaw Chippewa um, uh, uh, Museum and Cultural Centre, actually Zebra Wing uh, Cultural Centre, which is a Saginaw Chippewa community. And one of the interesting things, again, it's a community centre rather than um, just a museum. It has this uh, cultural centre and community centre within the cultural centre. Um, museum within the cultural centre, library within the cultural centre, there's some kids um, performing. And then the museum that tells people the story of um, itself and its community, always bringing um, historical contemporary images rather than tropes of identity, but interweaving them, um, oops, sorry, um, interweaving them with, um, with other and arguably um, more historical narrative, um, broader historical narrative, but disrupting that by talking about actual people. Um, representations like longhouses, uh, like this one, can be very tricky when they uh, are there on, uh, with what we call low curation. Um, where there isn't a lot of uh, interpretation around it. Um, and it became clear from the research that I was doing that one of the reasons why was because of the, um, the complexity that we find when people are adding their own voices. Um, so I became very interested in this notion um, of the reduced, um, trying to make these decisions. Um, so this Egyptian mummy thought to be a male priest as a pregnant woman. There was no uh, reason why they were thought to be male. <laughs> there was nothing that they had uh, understood. In fact, what had happened was that they found funerary items that looked like um, they imagined priests looked, but they had no idea of the gender for a start, and they had no idea of the sex either. Um, so all of this was based on their own presumptions. And part of what happens with uh, museums and with science in general is that this has to be rethought. So then the ancient remains in Peru reveal young female big game hunter. Okay, So this is a really interesting piece in terms of thinking about the past as reduced. Um, 
first of all, they have no way of knowing that this is female. Um, uh, female is used interchangeably with woman and the pronoun she all the way through <laughs> Uh, this work, this idea um, that this is a young woman who appears to have been a big game hunter, um, dare say she was, um, or is she a she? We don't know. And so to make these assumptions does some really important work when we talk about history. It tells a contemporary audience that has a complexity to their own gender that they've just arrived. It challenges Indigenous survivance. It challenges the idea that if you exist now, we exist in the past and we exist in the future. It challenges it by being incredibly reductive about it. It's pretty much clearly said, no, that isn't what happened. Um, and that's very intriguing. Um, so there's another interesting thing that happens with this particular piece, and that's that there is a suggestion that because there are a number of these figures, female participation in big game hunting was likely non-trivial. So there were likely a lot of them. And this is also used to describe elsewhere in this why they can't possibly be what they frame as gender non-conforming. I, I think that they mean trans and they just don't understand the language, but that's fine. Um, so rather than they've suggested that they can't possibly be trans because there's too many of them, which is, again, intriguing. All of this is a contemporary reading based on their own perspectives of the past based on bodies that they found. Um, and the complexity of those bodies um, is not very well understood either after this kind of passage of time. This is going back 9,000 years. So that, in fact, what they're doing is guesswork. Now, we spend a lot of time with guesswork on the past, um, when it comes to telling a story because you have to narrow a story to tell it. You know, if you were to tell the story of your life, you don't tell every single part of it. You narrow it down to the most important moments. And in that way, you're being selective. Curators are being selective too. They're just not including those complex parts that could suggest that they don't know. And they're making decisions based on what they think about gender. They're making decisions on the likelihood of multiple people on the basis that they see it as unlikely. So in other words, it's not on any scientific basis. The past is typically not very historically accurately reframed, and it's often not framed very well from a broader biological perspective either. People don't know. <laughs> uh, so they're playing a lot of guesswork. And the problem with guesswork is it relies on who is telling. This is the Turnbull problem, right? Um, so where we're faced now is thinking about our futures. Futurism can be problematic. This idea, the speculative, the, the future that um, has all possible answers, uh, but doesn't necessarily have questions and doesn't necessarily give us broad complexity either. So it tells us that we will be... Uh, able to do anything. It tells us that the future is filled with possibilities, but it doesn't necessarily set a path for that. So uh, futurism, when it comes to something like speculative fiction, is about imagining a future that you don't have to draw a journey from, right? But futures is often about questions. Our futures 
are often about questions that we might have answers to and that we might not understand um, yet. And so there are a lot of possibilities within that. When I was doing the museum's project, I was faced with an interesting problem. I went to the Museum of London that you see represented here, and I um, saw a 4,000-year-old timber figure. Um, it is a figure that they weren't too sure of the gender of, um, though they were very comfortable about gendering the figure, actually. So for a long time, it was considered a male figure for no reason, and then a female figure for no reason, and then um, a figure that they recognised they couldn't gender, uh, which presumably meant they couldn't binary gender. Uh, but actually, that's not the reason that I have this up. What's interesting about this is the text reads, London has changed dramatically since it was founded nearly 2,000 years ago. It also says, people lived in the Thames Valley long before London was built. This 4,000-year-old timber figure was found in Dagenham. This notion of a place being built a place coming into existence um, 2,000 years ago when, in fact, in the same bit of text, it says 4,000 years ago um, there were people who lived here uh, and it also talks about the settlements that they lived in. So this idea of the past as unknowable unless it's specifically named is part of what we see here. Um, this idea that the amorphous unknown uh, may have gone on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years but doesn't matter is um, not seen as inconsistent in this wall text to say, sure, there were people, but it wasn't London. Um, I mean, it's not contemporary London, isn't what they built 2,000 years ago. So, And they didn't build anything in the first instance. It was this idea that naming it that a colonial force coming in and naming something makes it real. So, so I'll finish off there, but just to say that um, one of the reasons that we're called the Centre for Global Indigenous Futures is that the linking up across the world is part of how we understand our relationship to one another is to say we are connected outside of uh, me as a Wiradjuri person, outside of the Wiradjuri. We're connected to other communities and other countries within so-called Australia. We're connected internationally through all of these networks and spaces. Looking at the international, um, looking at the work of someone like Visna with Indigenous survivors is a way that we can um, build on strengths Rather than, you know, the work that you read that was about saying there are these reduced ways of thinking and we have to somehow retain and somehow keep and somehow get back to, this is actually about growth and it's about building and it's about edifying and, um, and it's about futures. Thanks. <laughs>